learned professors like a jazz pianist by the name of Joseph Shiani, who lived in, in the NYU houses. But then with Ellie Seemeister, who was a major uh, teacher, had studied with Nad Nadia Boulanger and gave me the training that he got in the 20s when he was there with Aaron Copeland. Mm. Through him, I met Aaron Copeland. And I met many other luminaries who came to the house. Uh, Nicholas Slonimsky, um, 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 Sidney uh, Cowell, the, the widow of Henry Cowell, the man who can, who premiered the Berg Violin Concerto. I mean, I met all these people at his house, normal meetings. And Siegmeister regaled me with stories of his pieces being done by Toscanini and Stokowski, who I met through him, Metropolis. It was just a great milieu to be in. And he was an extremely difficult teacher, putting me through the Boulanger training, which I now put my students through, which is years and years and years of 16th century counterpoint of canon and few. I give you the illustration. Mm -hmm. Behind me is this painting, and then there's a sheetrock wall. There's a chest of drawers here. But if there was a fancy cabinet, I would say to you, can any carpenter make that? Carpenter might be able to put up the sheetrock against studs, right? But can somebody really make a fine cabinet? Mm. So what I tell students is, if you want to write a symphony or a sonata, or good songs, pure instrumental piece for solo instrument. How are you going to do this unless you've trained? You got to study with a master teacher who's gone through with his master teacher when he was an apprentice, she was an apprentice. You can't think you're going to write anything with counterpoint and development and four or five minutes, 20 minutes, two and a half hours of, of content. It's no different than the great jazz musicians that I met, who like Louis Armstrong and Buck Clayton and Coleman Hawkins and Stan Kenton, all of those people worked constantly with other people learning their craft over many, 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 many decades. It takes time. Mm -hmm. But if, now let's talk about eating and breathing. I was with a conductor, a young conductor, Kalina Bovell recently, she was assisting at Nashville where I was with my- yeah, I know Kalina. You know Kalina? Yeah, I do. Very different. She's a sweetheart. Yeah. In yeah. any of them, Kalina and I were together with Giancarlo Guerrero at Nashville Symphony. Gigi, we call him Giancarlo, is a very different. So we were down there and we were walking to lunch and Kalina says to me, how do you compose? What, do you ever think about why you compose? I said, okay, Kalina, what are we doing now? She says, we're, we're going to get a sandwich. I said, yeah, same thing. I have to eat. You all have to eat. We all have to breathe, but I have to write. I have to hear. It's constant. Hours and hours a day, seven days a week, unless I'm about to conduct an orchestra. And if I'm about to uh, conduct an orchestra or play piano in a concert, I'm studying those scores and playing them or figuring out with like an orchestra. I'm conducting the Royal Philharmonic in London in uh, November at Abbey Road Studios where the Beatles were. And before I get in front of that orchestra, which is one of the greatest orchestras in the world, I am going to study my score so intensely. So about six weeks, I will do nothing else. I won't be writing my music. I'll be studying scores. Um, I'm conducting it at the Atlanta Opera, where I hope you all can come at October 28th, my Frankenstein, the movie opera. Although I've done this piece over 20 times, it's been done over 60 times worldwide, I'll still be studying it. Because when I get in front of that orchestra, I have to know their parts better than they do. I have to understand the context. I have to understand everything. So what is this all coming down to? I have to be making that great break front cabinet. I have to be a master carpenter or master chef or master whatever. It's just an enormous amount of work. It also helps that I've had training that I still rely on. One final example, when I conducted the BBC before the pandemic, the BBC National Orchestra of Wales in Cardiff, uh, in my music and it's a recording that's available on the platforms, we came to a piece of mine that I'd written in my early 20s, which had late 20s, which had multiple meters, meaning 5A, 4A, 3A, whatever. And I was conducting away, and 
they weren't getting it. And the concert mistress said, why did you do it in quavers? Eighth notes. So I said, ah. So I thought back of my stud studies at Juilliard with Madame René Longy, who I tell you a story about, re refresh my recollection later, tell you a story about Madame Longy. And she taught us rhythmic dictation. I was in her advanced class. So I started to go into whack, 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 you know, steady eighths. Right. And then the orchestra pop did it. So training gets you through those things. And I don't care who you are. I've seen Pierre Boulez do work with, with the Juilliard Orchestra and the Philharmonic. And I saw the way he would, you know, do his Pierre Boulez thing. And that comes out of his conservatoire background. Mm -hmm. Question about it. And through, you know, what we call rhythmic solfege. Mm -hmm. If he hadn't had it when he was in his teens and 20s, right. he couldn't get in front of the, these right. officers and do it. Same thing. Over time. Over time. So that little boy had to be trained right. and had to continually read scores, which I still do all the time.